Okay. So here we go. This this is this is also uh, R for Data Science: The Free and Easy Way uh, Introduction and Chapter One to R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham. This is the website for the R for Data Science book. This book will teach you how to do data science with R. You will learn how to get how to get your uh, make sure we are getting some sound here. Get some get some. Okay, good. And so the purpose again is for, for you just join me on, on YouTube. We're going to we're going to do a, a page by page reading of the R for Data Science book, and we're going to retype all the code by hand, or maybe some we're going to use this, we're going to use an existing uh, existing repository. Okay, so here we go. You will learn how to get your data into R, get it into the most useful structure, transform, visualize it, and model it. In this book, you will find a a, a practicum of skills for data science. Just as a chemist learns how to clean test tubes and stack and stock a lab, you learn how to clean data and draw plots, and many other things besides. These are the skills that allow data science to happen, and and here you will find the best practices for doing each of these things in R. You will learn how to use the grammar of graphics literate programming, and, re and reproducible research to save time. You, all, you will also learn how to manage cognitive resources and to facilitate discoveries when wrangling, visualizing, and exploring data. This, this website and is and will always be free to use. It's licensed under Creative Commons uh, attribution, non-commercial, non-derived 3 uh, not sure what that means. Uh, license. If you'd like a physical copy of the book, you can you can order one online on Amazon. It was published by Raleigh in 2017. If you'd like to give give back, please make a donation to the Capco Recovery, the the Capco uh, which appears on the cover of uh, R for Data Science is a critically endangered native uh, New Zealand parrot parrot with only 213 left. Please note that the R for Data Science uses a contributor code of contact. By contributing to this book, you agree to abide by the terms. Acknowledgements. R for Data Science is a collaborative effort, and many people have contributed fixes and improvements via pull request. Well, I'm not going. I'm not. I'm not going to actually going to read all these things here. Okay. <laughs> okay. R for Data says is hosted by by NetFi.com as part of their support of open source software and communities. Let's move on to the uh, introduction now. Okay, data science is an exciting uh, discipline that allows you to turn raw data into an understanding, insights, and knowledge. The goal of R for Data Science is to help you learn the most important tools in R that will allow you to do data science. After reading this book. You will you will have the tools to tackle a wide variety of data science problems, data science uh, variety of data science cha uh, challenges using the the best part of R. Data science is a huge field, and there's no way you can master it by reading a single book. The goal of this book is to give you a solid foundation and the most important tools. Our model of books that needed our model of the tools needed. In typical data science project, looks something like this: import the data, clean the data, transform and, and, and wrangle the data, visualize the data, communicate, create a model, and loop and loop and loop and loop. Understand, okay? First, you first you must import the data into R. This typically means that you you have data stored in a file, a database, a web application, uh, a web application programming, a web application programming interface, application programming interface web or and load it into a data frame in R. If you can't get your data into R, you can't do data science on it. Once you've imported your data, it's a good idea to, to tidy it. Tidying your data means means uh, strong means storing in a consistent form that matches the semantics semantics of the data set with the way it is stored. 
in brief, when you when you when you tidy when your data is tidy, each column is a variable and each row is an observation or record. Tidy data is an important because the consistent structure that you focus your your struggles on questions about data, not fighting to get the data into the right form for different functions. Once you have, once you have tidy data, a common first step is trans is to transform it. Transformation includes narrowing, narrowing in on observations of interest, like all the people in one city or all the data from one from, from last year, creating new variables that are functions of, of existing variables, like computing speed for distance and time, and calculating a set of summary statistics like counts or means. Together, tidying and transforming is called data. It's called wrangling. Because getting your data in a form that is natural to work with often feels like a fight. Once you uh, once you have a tidy data with the variables you need, there are there are there are two main engines of knowledge generation: visualization and modeling. Most of my concern for the last four or five years has been on visualization. Okay, so here we go. There, these have complementary strengths and weaknesses. So any any good any real analysis will, will iterate between will uh, iterate i iterate uh, iterate between them many times. Visualization is fundamentally a human activity. A good visualization will show you that things that you should not that you do not expect. Or raise questions about data. A good visualization might also hint that you're asking the wrong question, or you you need the wrong, or you or you need to collect different data. Visualizations can surprise you, but don't scale particularly well because they they require a human require a human to interpret them. Models are complementary to not to tools of visualization. Once you have made your your question sufficiently precise, you can use data use a data a model to answer the, answer them. Models are a fundamentally mathematical or computational tool, so they generally scale well, even when they don't. It's usually cheaper to buy more computers than it is to buy more brains, <laughs> more data. Okay, but every model makes assumptions, and by its very nature, a model cannot cannot Answer its own assumptions. The model, the mean, the mean. Stay tuned in the model section for for a very famous quote by a guy by a British statistician by the name of George Box. That's a few. That's a few chapters done already. That just be sure to keep an eye out for that. Okay. The mean. That means a model cannot fundamentally surprise you. Model cannot question its own assumption. That means that a model cannot fundamentally surprise you. I'm not sure if that's true. But anyway, okay. The last step of data science is communication, an absolutely critical part. Critical part of any data analysis project. It doesn't matter how well your models and visualizations have led you to understand the data, unless you can communicate the results to others. Surrounding all these tools is programming. Programming is a cross-cutting tool. That you use in, in in every part of the project. You don't need to be a, a an expert programmer to be a data scientist, but learning more about about programming pays off because off because becoming a better programmer allows you to automate common tasks and solve new problems with greater ease. You'll use these tools in every data science project. But it, but for most projects, they're not enough. Uh oh, there's roughly an 80/20 rule at play. <laughs> you can tackle by 80% of every project using the tools that you learn in this book, but you'll need other tools to ta tools to tackle the the remaining 20%. <laughs> Throughout this book, we'll point to you to resources where you can learn more. Section chapter 1.2.
Okay. The previous, the previous description of the tools of, the, of data science is organized roughly according to the order which you'll, you, you use them in your analysis. All of the, of course, you will itinerate through them uh, multiple times. In our, in our experience, however, this is not the best way to learn them, okay? The previous description of tools of data science is organized roughly according in the order in which you, you use them. In our experience, however, this is not the best way to learn them. Starting with data ingest and tidying is uh, suboptimal because 80% of the, of, the, of the time it's, it's routine and boring, and the other 20% of the time it's weird and frustrating. <laughs> nice. That's a bad place to start learning new, new subjects. Instead, we'll start with, the, with visualization and information of data that already has been imported and, and tidied. That's why when you ingest and tidy your day, own data, your motivation will stay high because you know the, plain, the pain is worth it. No pain, no gain, right? Some topics are best explained with other tools. For example, we believe that it's easier to understand how models work if you, if you already know about visualizations tidy data, and programming. Programming tools are not necessarily interested in their own right, but do allow you to tackle uh, considerably more challenging problems. We'll give you a, a selection of programming tools in the middle of the book. Oops, what happened there? That's kind of strange. Oh, here we go. Hmm, interesting. Give you a selection of programming tools in the middle of the book, and then you'll see how they can combine with data science tools to tackle interesting modeling problems. Within each book, we try to stick to a, uh, an important, uh, we try to stick to a, a, a similar pattern. Start with some motivating examples so you can see the bigger picture, and then dive into the details. Hang on, I need, I need to put my pad back on my seat. It's hard on, it's, there we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Each, ver each section of the book is paired with exercises to help you practice what you've learned. While, while it's tempting to skip exercises, there's, there's no better way to learn than practicing them on real problems. 1.3, what, what you, once you won't learn, Okay, this is really important. There are some important topics that this book doesn't cover. We believe it's important to stay ruthlessly focused on essentials so that you get up and running as quickly as possible. That means this book uh, can't cover every important topic, big data. This book proudly focuses on small in-memory data sets. That, that, that word in-memory is very, very important. Okay, very important. Because, because our... It loads everything into memory, okay, and runs everything in memory, okay. I have 16 gigabytes on, of memory on my computer. I'm not sure how much is actually free at the moment, but I mean, and, and, and realistically, you can run R with four uh, gigabytes of memory, but if you start trying to stack up, you know, a couple of, a couple hundred megabytes of data, it's going to slow it down, okay. Uh, like I said, I, I haven't run any problem with the system locking up so far with, uh, uh, I haven't run any problems with, uh, with, uh, with my 16 gigabytes of memory and data. And I've, lo I've loaded as much as like, uh, what, 300 megabytes in without any trouble whatsoever. So, so remember, so when you ever have a question, you know, if your system's slow and it seems to be locking up, it's probably a memory problem. Okay. You know, you, 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 you can't, you know, you can't put five pounds of butter into a two pound box, as the old saying goes. Right? Anyway, focus on small and memory data sets. This is the right place to start because you can't tackle big data unless you can unless you have experience with small data. The tools you learn in this book will easily handle hundreds of megabytes of data. With, little, with a little care, you can typically use, 
use them to work with one to two gigabytes of data. If you're routinely working with larger data, 10 to 100 gigabytes, say, you, you should learn more about data table. Uh-oh. That's nice of him to include that down there. This book doesn't teach data table because it has a very concise interface, which makes it harder to learn since it offers fewer linguistic cue, clues. But uh, data table, so it, 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 as he says, is uh, I used to use a little bit of data table, but I don't anymore. I've pretty much switched to most. Well, I don't even use, I rarely use data table, but it's supposed to because it's written in C. It's like very. It's really fast. I mean, it really does. It's really fast. And, and it and but it does do a lot of the things that other base R functions does, like subsets and uh, and uh, and you can do group group totals and stuff like that. But uh, but anyway, okay. So anyway, this book doesn't use it because plus he does use it because he he, he didn't write it. <laughs> it has a very concise interface. It makes it it's harder to learn some of its all uh, since it offers fewer linguistic clues. But if you're working with large data, the performance payoff is worth the extra required to learn it. If your data is bigger than this, carefully consider if, if, if your big data problem might already actually be a, a small data problem in disguise. While the, while the complete data may be big, often the data needed to answer a specific question is small. You might be able to uh, find a subset subsample or summary that fits in the memory and still allows you to answer the question you're interested in. The challenge here is to find the right small data, which often requires a lot of itineration. Well, it says I have one viewer now. Well, that viewer could be me. <laughs> okay. Another possibility is that your big data problem is that oh, we are at it. Let's see something here. Another possibility is your big data problem uh, is actually a large, a large number of small data problems. Let's read that again. Another possibility is that your big data problem is actually a large number of small data problems. For instance, individual problems may fit in the memory, but you have millions of them. For example, you, you might want to fit a model in which to each person in your data, at each person in your data set. This would this would be trivial if you have 10 to 100 people, but instead you have a million. Fortunately, each problem is independent of each of, of, of the others. A setup that's sometimes called embarrassingly parallel. So you just need a system like a Hadoop or Spark that allows you to send different data sets to different computers for processing. Once you figure out how to answer the question for a single subset using the tools described in this book, you'll you'll learn new tools like Spark R, uh, R Hype, and, and DDR to solve it for full data sets. 1.32. Python, Julia, and Friends. In this book, you won't learn anything about Python, Julia, or any other programming languages useful for data science. It isn't because we think the, these tools are bad. They're not. And in practice, most data scientist teams use a mix, a mix of languages. Often it's R, R and Python. However, we strongly believe that, that, that because that it's best to master one at a time, you will get better faster if you dive deep rather than spending your, your, your time uh, yourself thinly over many topics. This doesn't mean you should only learn, know one. Th you should only know one thing. Just that you generally learn faster if you stick to one thing at a time. That certainly is true. That certainly was a, true for me. You should strive to learn new things throughout your career, but make sure your understanding is solid before you move on to the next thing. Okay. So, no one's popped in the chat. Well, let's see what's going on. Let's see. 
interesting things. We think that R, R is a great place to start your data science journey because it is an environment designed from the ground up to support data science. And there you go, that's a very important factor. Uh, Python is not a data science language by itself, okay? Uh, it is a general, general purpose scripting language, okay? Obviously, with add-on packages like Pandas, NumPy, uh, Matplotlib, SciPy, and stuff like that, you can do data science. But it's not a data science language. And I'll tell you right up front, R is a much easier language to use, learn, than Python. R is a statistical language written by statisticians for data science, okay? And that's what he says here. Designed from the ground up to support data science and statistics, R is not just a programming language, but it's an interactive environment for doing data science. To support interaction, R is a much more flexible language than many of its peers. This flexibility comes with its downside, but the big upside is how easy it is to evolve tailored grammars, how easy it is to evolve tailored grammars for specific parts of the data science project process. These many languages help you think about problems as a data science while supporting fluent itineration between your brain and your computer. Non-rectangular data. 1.3.3. This book focuses exclusively on rectangular data, collection of values that are each associated with variables and observations. There are lots of data sets that do not naturally fit into this paragraph, including images, sound, trees, and text. But rectangular data frames are extremely common in science and industry. And we believe that, I would say that, you could safely say that rectangular is probably the most, most widely viewed data source because of Excel, right? Okay, so, but rectangular data frames are extremely common in science and industry, and we believe that they, they, they are a great place to start your data science journey. Hypothesis confirmation. It is possible to divide data and analysis into two camps, hypothesis generation and hypothesis confirmation, sometimes called confirmatory analysis. The focus of, uh, of this book is unabashedly on hypothesis generation or data exploration. Here you'll look at deeply into the data and in combination with the, your subject knowledge, generate many interesting hypotheses to help explain why the data behaves the way it does. You evaluate the hypothesis informally, using your skepticism to challenge the data in multiple ways. The, co the complement of hypothesis generation is hypothesis confirmation. Hypothesis confirmation is hard for two reasons. You need precise mathematical model in order to generate falsifiable predictions. Okay, this yeah, this is talking about the null hypothesis. Okay. This often requires considerable statistical sophistication. Because the purpose of, of course, the purposes of uh, is, is a null hypothesis is to prove the null hypothesis wrong. So it's to prove it, to prove that a hypothesis is false, okay? Two, you can only use an observation once to confirm a hypothesis. As soon as you use it more than once, you're back to doing exploratory analysis. <laughs> This means to do hypothesis confirmation, you need to pre-register right out in advance your analysis plan and not deviate from it when you see the data. We'll talk a little about these, some strategies you can use to make this easier than modeling. Okay, now it's common to think about modeling as a tool for hypothesis confirmation and visualization as, a, as for hypothesis generation. But, but this is a false dichotomy. Models are often used for exploration 
And with a little care, you can use visualization for confirmation. The key difference is how often do you look at each observation. If you look at it only once, it's confirmation. If you look at it more than once, it's exploration. Now, most of what I do is exploration. Okay, I, I really do. I, I can say I never, I never really do models. It's all about the. Uh, Okay, prerequisites. We made a few assumptions about what you already know in order to get to the get to the most out of this book. You should be generally numerically literate, and it's helpful if you if you have some programming experience already. Eh. If you've never programmed before, you might find hands-on programming by Garrett to be useful. Hmm, that's an interesting question. We'll see. There are four things you need to run. You need to run the code in this book. R, R Studio, a collection of R packages called Toddyverse, and you actually need one other in Windows. And that's R Tools 4.0, okay. Called Toddy. And although, in all honesty, you may not need R Tools to. to well, I think he, I think he, you you have to have our tools. I believe you certainly need our tools to compile programs from source, and you may need it to actually be able to install programs called a tidyverse. A handful of other program packages. Packages are the the fundamental units of reproducible R code. Now, that's an interesting observation. They include reusable functions, the documentation that describes how to use them, and sample data. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, excuse me, Warner. I'm going to get a cup of coffee. I'll be back in like five minutes. Okay, I'm back. I got my cup of joe here now. We're good for another hour. <sighs> okay. To download R, go to CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network. You know, search search for R uh, language downloads. Okay, Google R language download will take you to the site. Uh, R, and I'm pretty here's the thing. I'm pretty sure that uh, Hadley and a lot of the 
you know, stars of our program and you use uh, uh, Macs. That's why I say if you're using Windows like me, you have to install a third package called RTools 4.0. Okay. I'll mention right now the current version of R, and you want to keep your R version current, is 1.4.1.1. Okay. So anyway, to, to download R, go to CRAN, the, the R Archive Network, the comprehensive. CRAN is, the, is, is composed of a set of uh, mere servers distributed around the world and is used to di is distribute R and R packages. And, and there's a link right there. Don't try, don't try, don't try and pick a mirror that's close to you. Instead, use the cloud mirror, which automatically figures it out for you. Okay. A new major R version of R comes out once a year, and there are two to three minor releases each year. It's a good idea to update regularly. Upgrading can be a bit of a hassle, especially for major versions, which require you to reinstall all your packages. But putting it off only makes things worse. Now, R Studio, R Studio, okay? I'll show you quickly what R Studio looks like in the flesh. This is what it looks like. It has a series of, has a series by default. It has four wind, four panes, four windows. You have a uh, an editor, uh, a script editor window. You have a, a console one where the output from your command shows up. You got an environment pane which which, which shows you got an environment. You got an environment pane, which is where all, when you created a data frame or variables, it appears over here. It's got the files. Show, it shows the files in the current directory. Most important of all, probably this right there. Uh, this 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 is where you go for your packages. Okay, you can you can click on install package, install package. Very important. Uh, regularly. Every day when I start up our first time, I run package update here. You want to keep your packages up to date. There's also a tutorial section up here, which, which, is, which is another way to learn R, <laughs> okay? So I'm, I'm certainly open. And, and you got uh, history, you got where your plots appear, a help screen, okay? We can, we can type, you can type in the help fun. You can type in different, uh, uh, different commands and functions to get information on them, okay? But we'll be back to that in a moment. Let's see, our stu our student is an integrated development environment or IDE for our program. You know, a lot of people, some people confuse our our studio with R itself. Okay, uh, two different things. R is the language. Our studio is is the development environment. Okay. So if someone asks you what version of R you are you running? Do not ask them for your studio version. They're asking for your R program and language version. Okay. So anyway, download and install from uh, rstudio.com. Our studio is updated a couple times a year. When a new version comes out, when a new version uh, version is available, our studio will let you know. It's a good way to upgrade. It's a good idea to upgrade regularly so that you can so you can take advantage of the latest and greatest features. For this book, make sure you have at least uh, R Studio 1.0. What's the current version here? The current version is 1.4.7171. Okay. Now, when you start our studio, you'll see two two key regions of the interface. For now, all you need to know is that uh, is that you type R code into the console pane and press enter and run it. You'll you'll learn more about uh, more as we go along. Tidy verse boom 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 boom. Okay, sorry, I got a little carried away there. The tidy verse. You also need to install some R packages. Our packages is a, our, and our package is a collection of functions, data, and documentation that extends the capabilities of base R. Using packages as a key to using packages is a key to your successful use of R. Absolutely, cannot be overstated enough. Okay. The majority of packages that you will learn in this book are part of the so-called tidyverse. 
the packages in the in the tidyverse in tidyverse share share a, a common philosophy of data and our programming and are designed to, to work together actually you can install the complete tidyverse package with this line of code so let's just let's just see what this looks like when you when you install a tidyverse package okay like i say the the way you the way you normally want to install packages is from the package menu packages install okay type in type in the uh, the code you're looking for the, the the package you're looking for okay and then click and then, then click install dependencies and also you know uh the first time you run it's probably going to ask you for where where you, where you want to install it They'll give you a pop-up and it'll ask you to pick a to pick a repository. Okay. So let's just let's just go ahead and run this here so you can see exactly what it looks like. Well that was pretty quick, wasn't it? <laughs> I was I was expecting a little more. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's pop it's probably because it's already been installed, I'm guessing. I don't know. <laughs> That was impressive, wasn't it? Okay. Now, on your own computer, type that line of code into the console and then press enter. R, R will download the packages from CRAN and install them on your computer. If you have problems installing, make sure you, you are connected to the internet and that the, R, 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 the cloud.rproject.org isn't blocked by a firewall proxy. You will not be able to, to use the functions, objects, and help files in a package until you learn it uh, learn it with a, with a library. Load it in the library. Once you install the package, you can you can load it with a with a library function. You know, let's let's try one more thing. Let's just try to install this up here. See if we, see if we can actually see a little bit more what's going on. Like I said, this has already been installed, but I want to, I want to see if you can maybe see uh, some of the dependencies being installed. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that still didn't do us what we wanted to do. Normally, you would see you would see a list of uh, all the packages being installed that's part of Tidyverse, okay? But most of them have already been installed or already updated or something like that. So let's just keep going along. So once again, load it with the library function, library tidyverse, okay? Okay, so let's run this command. Nor normally, you, normally you wouldn't do this in, in the console prompt, you would do it in, the, in, a, in, a, in a script. Let's see what happens here. Okay, so this tells us that the the files it's it's, in, it's part of the uh, attaching file ggplot2 tibble tidyr read r per dplyr string string r and four cats and these and these give you the versions of these things. Now it says here conflicts filter stats. Okay, so what happens is tidyverse. Uh, replaces these stats here. So by default, if I if I come down here and I type filter, which will make any sense right now, by default, it's going to run the tidyverse package. If I wanted to run the package from stats, I could come back over here. Stats followed by stats followed by two by two colons and the and the function I want to call, I could run this I can run the filter command from stats. Now, more than likely, it probably served the same function, but we can't be sure unless you actually looked at it. So, what's it say here? There. Tidyverse 1.3, attaching packages, tidyverse conflicts. Well, like I say, if, if by default, okay, filters is going to be part of. Uh, Okay, well here you can see again, filter was found in the following packages, stats and dplyr. But by, by default, <coughs> uh, 
Excuse me. Hmm. Oops, let me check and make sure I didn't turn myself off here. Testing one, two, three. Okay, good. Okay. But by default, you, sh you should be running uh, the, the tidyverse version of filter, for instance. Okay. Once you install the package, you can load it with this. We just did this also. This tells you that tidyverse is loading ggplot to tibble, tidyr, readr, per uh, the plier. What are you going to lose all the time? You're going to use tidyverse and readr all the time and dplyr and tibble and per. Okay. The, these are considered to be core, the core of the tidyverse because you'll use them them almost in every analysis. Okay. Packages in tidyverse change frequently. Okay. You can, you can see if packages are available and optionally install them by running uh, tidyverse update. Okay. Tidyverse update. Let's see what this tells us here. Now, I didn't actually know about that command. All tidyverse packages are up to date. Now, that's what I want to say one more time. If you come over here and you click on package update, Anything that appears in this box here can be updated. Although I know this, I know there's a problem with this in here in my system because of the GTK. But come up here. This is the preferred way to uh, to update because this does a much better job of making sure the dependencies are updated. Also, and I can see it's installing. See what it says here. Do you want to install from sources the package which needs yes? Generally speaking, you want to say yes to this number. And this is why you need our tools 4.0. Okay. Now, let, let's just say you, you sit here and you install this and you get an error message. And you don't know how to resolve the error message. Go back, rerun the install, update. Okay. Run the package update a second time and say no to when it's asked you if you want to, I mean, you want to update from the sources, say no to that question for the second time. Okay. Now you can see this could take a while to download. So I'll come back here in a moment. Other packages. There are, there, there are many other excellent packages that are not part of Tidyverse because they solve problems in a different domain or a different in a domain meaning a different area of data science. You know, economics versus uh, whatever. You know, or a design with with a with a different set of underlying principles. This doesn't make them better or worse, just different. In other words, the complement to the Tidyverse is not the Messyverse. <laughs> but many other universes are interrelated packages. As you tackle more data science projects with R, you'll, you'll learn new packages and new ways of thinking about data. So how are we doing here? Okay, so we're, getting, we're actually getting close to, to, to finishing the first chapter. And that'll probably be it for tonight. As far, as far as the first part of screencast, okay? Now, is this finished? So you see, uh-oh. Unfortunately, um, iGraph didn't install. I, I hate to say, but I'm actually glad this occurred because it wasn't installed. It says here, fatal error, GL, GL PKH, no such file or directory. And I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure what that file is. So that, that tells you that there's an error, which means everything below this probably failed. The says uh, compil compilation uh, terminated. Okay. And once again, it says iGraph had non zero stat access status. Okay. Uh, so that means that the latest version of uh, iGraph wasn't installed. So let's try one more thing. Let's try to update it one more time. Now there may there may not be another version of it because of uh, see it says since since the source failed to install the first time we're going to say no. Okay, so that worked. That's probably one of the things that's Thinks you really used to get used to how to look for errors when you try to install a package. So anyway, 
other packages, one foot four to four, we're getting close to the end, okay, of chapter one. Now, there are many other pack. there are many excellent packages, okay, principles. As you tackle more data science projects with R, you will learn new packages and new ways of thinking about things. Now, one of the things you have to learn about that, in this book, we'll use three different data packages from outside of Tidyverse. Copy this. New York City Flights, Gapminder, and, and Layman. Layman, if, you, if you're into sports, this is, this is a baseball statistics database, okay? I don't know the guy personally, so we're gonna come over here So now we're going to install these three data sets. Okay, so they all, unfall, they all installed fine. Now, these packages provide data on airline flights, world development, and baseball that will be used, be used to illustrate key data science ideas. Running our code. In the previous section, the previous section showed you a couple examples of, of running our code. Code in our, and, and, and the book looks like this. One plus two is three. If you run the sample code in your, in your, in your local console, it will look like this. Okay. There you go. That's a calculator. <laughs> okay. There are two main reasons, two main difference in your console you type after the call to prompt. There are two main differences in your console. Okay. There are two main differences in your console, you type you type after the greater than sign called the prompt. We don't show the prompt in the book. In the book, uh, output is commented with the with the bracket, with the, with the uh, okay the pound sign and the, and the right arrow. In your console, it appears directly after the code. These two differences mean that 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 you're working with an electronic version of the book. You can easily copy code out of the book into your console. Okay. Throughout the book, we use a consistent set of conventions to refer to code. Functions are functions are are the are are in, functions are in a code font. Uh, followed by parentheses. So that's, that's a slightly different plot there, okay? Okay. Other R objects like data functions or, or, uh, or function arguments are in a code font without parentheses, okay? If you want to make it clear what package an object comes from, we'll use the package followed by two colons. Of course, we already discussed that, didn't we? Okay, this is valid code. This is also valid code, okay? Okay, so will we actually have any fun yet? I don't know. This book is not an island. Okay, getting help and learning more. Okay, this book is not an island. There is no single source that will allow you to master R. As you start to apply the techniques described in this book to your own data, you will, you will soon find uh, questions that we do not answer. This section describes a few tips on how to get help and how and, and help you can learn. You, you, can, you can keep learning. If you get stuck, 
start with Google. There you go. Your two best friends are Google and YouTube, particularly when you first started out, okay? Because none of your every one of your questions that you got and you first starting out is going to be answered somewhere on Google and YouTube, okay? Google and YouTube. Typically, adding an R to a query is enough to restrict the relevant results. Okay, that's very true. Let's just come over here. Okay, and search R. Are Bayesian models. Open data science Bayesian model. Bayesian models in R's, Bayesian models in R, video books, Bayesian and R, get up pages, and so forth. And here's some videos. So all I did, I searched for R and exactly what I was looking for, okay? Also, as I said before, you, you can search for, right? And here's where we are right now, okay? So it's absolutely correct. Google and YouTube is your best friend. You know, if you're looking for something very specific, search for exactly what you're looking for, okay? Whether it's looking for a way to do uh, rolling averages or, or linear regressions, search for what you're looking for. Okay, be, as, be, as, be as, as concise and precise as you can in your queries, okay? So anyway, Google. If the search isn't useful, it often means that there aren't enough, there aren't any R-specific results available. Google is particularly useful for error messages. If you get an error message, you have no idea what it means, try Googling it. Chances are that someone else has been confused by it in the past. <laughs> very true. Very true. Okay. Fast. And there will be help somewhere on the web. If the error message isn't in English, run set, sys, sys environment, uh, set environment uh, in English and rerun the code. You may, you might likely to find help for the English error messages. You're more likely to find help in English error messages. Now, if Google doesn't help, try Stack Overflow. Actually, I would suggest not Stack Overflow as your first choice. Okay, let me let me introduce you to two other sources. Okay, Facebook. Uh, there is a R statistical language group, pretty good group. I would certainly suggest that that's probably your first place to post questions. Uh, the other place is, is, is called Slack. Okay. Now, 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 there's an app for both your phone and your desktop for Slack, okay? And you're looking for the R for Data Science Online Community, okay? Let's try something here. Okay. App directory. Okay. Let 
Okay, there there is a there is an R for let's see if we can do something here. R for data science Slack channel. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is also a good place. To R for data science. I haven't actually been out here before. Okay. So, R for datasci.com. Let's, let's click on, ta on Slack. You could probably search R for data science online, maybe. This 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 is also an incredibly helpful and supportive group. Uh, of course, the key to these groups is the harder you try, the hard and the harder you show them that you're trying, the more willing they are to help you. Okay. Now, start by spending a little time searching for the existing answer, including R to restrict your search to question and answers. Use R. If you don't find any anything useful. Prepare a minimal reproducible example or a repax. Uh, a good repax makes it easier for other people to help you, and often you'll figure out the problem yourself in the course of making it. There are three things you need to include in any example reproducible. We need packages should be loaded at the top of the script, so it's easy to see which ones uh, the example needs. This is a good time to check that you're using the latest version of each package. It's possible, it's, it's possible you discovered a bug that, that's been fixed since you installed the package. For examples in Tidyverse, the easiest way to check is to run Tidyverse underscore update. Okay? The easiest way to include data in a question is to use dput. I've never had much, I've never had much luck with dput, honestly, uh, to generate the R code and recreate it. For example, to recreate the empty car data set in R, I perform the following things. D put M car. Okay. So what does the output from D put actually look like? So what is, what what does the dput command actually do? Write an object to a file or recreate it. Write a write write say a ASCII text representation of an R object in a file to the R console or connection or uses to recreate an object. Hmm. So. So it essentially does, it, it, it kind of does what I say a write CSV does, okay? All right. Uh, empty cars output. Copy the output in my, in my reproducible example script. Type empty cars, blank, then paste. Try and find a small subset of data that would build the things. Spend a little, a little bit of time ensuring that your code is easy for others to read. Make sure you use spaces or variable names that are concise. Yet informative. Use comments to indicate where your line, where your problem lines are. Do your best to remove everything that's not related to the problem. The shorter your code, the easier it is to understand, easier it is to fix. Okay. 
Finish by checking that you that you actually made a reproducible example by starting a, a fresh R session and copying and pasting your script in. You should also spend some time preparing yourself to, to solve problems before they occur. Invest in a little time and learning R each day will pay off handsomely in the in the long run. One way to one way is is to follow what what Hadley Garrett said, Hadley and Garrick said, and everyone else at our studio are doing on the R blog. Let's just see what this looks like. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Let's see some here. So new tab. So here is the law. Why your data science team might need a shiny development engineer. R Studios Connect 2109 Tabula Analytics Extension. That's interesting. R Studio Connect introduces support for Tabula Analytics Extensions in an integration that enables you to create R or Python hmm, teaching biomedic data science students using R Cloud. Pins, one of, Pins is now available at Cran. The Pins packages publishes data, models, and other R objects, making it easier to share them. That's interesting, okay. R Studio table, table contest for 2021, okay. So, this is where we post announcements about new packages, new IDE features, and in-person courses. You might also want to follow Hadley or Garrett on Twitter. Or follow our studio tips to keep up with the latest things. Okay, we're we're actually getting very close to the end of of, of, of the of the of, of, of the introduction and chapter one. The fun begins tomorrow night. Okay, this book is okay. To keep up with the R community more broadly, we recommend reading the rbloggers.com. It aggregates over 500 blogs about R from around the world. If you're an active Twitter user, follow the R stats hashtag. Twitter is one of the key tools that Hadley uses to keep up new develop to keep up with new developments in his community. Acknowledgements: This book isn't just a product of Hadley and Garrett, but it's a result of many conversations in person and online that we've had with many people in the R community. There are a few people. We'd like to thank in, like to thank in particular because they have spent many hours answering our dumb questions and helping us to better think about data science. Jenny Bryan and Lionel Henry for the many helpful discussions around working with lists and list columns. The three chapters on workflow were adapted with permission from STAT 545, this over here, Workspace WD Projects by Jenny Bryan. Geneva Allen for, for discussions about models and modeling, the statistical learning uh, perspective, and the difference between hypothesis generation, hypothesis and confirmation. UZ for his work on block down package and for the tireless responding to uh, our many feature requests. Bill Bierman for his thoughtful reading of the entire book, for trying it out with, with his data science class in Stanford. <laughs> the, R, the R Stats Twitter community uh, who, who reviewed all the different chapters and provided tons of useful feedback. Tao Gilali for, for, for augmenting his, his D index, index in package to support a section on clustering that did not make it to the final draft. This book is written in the open, and many people contribute and pull, uh, request it to fix the minor problems. Many, many people here were listed. Finally, we end, we end chapter one. An online version of this book is available here, which this is where we are right now. It will continue to evolve between reprints and, and physical books. The source book is down here. This book is powered by Blockdown, which is, so this is what it looks like right here.
Okay. Welcome to the end of chapter one. Uh, let's see. So this concludes our R for data science session for tonight. So let me let me immediately stop.